every school I've been involved in, any university school that any of us have been involved in, claims to be unique. But I do believe that Brandeis' claim to uniqueness is in fact unique. Uh, and it's interesting that Joe's description of the uniqueness of Delit really is at the heart of the uniqueness of Brandeis. The fact that we could at one and the same time be a distinctly Jewish institution and yet a distinctly American institution wrapped up in an insight that our namesake, Louis Brandeis, had long before it was fashionable when he talked about what it meant to be a great American for Jewish Americans required them first to be great Jews. And if you know a little bit about Louis Brandeis, it's not like he was exactly a from guy. He actually got himself in a little bit of trouble when his sister, I guess, had uh, taken a shine to a Orthodox fellow, and so she went to Yom Kippur services with him. And Justice Brandeis' parents asked him to go pick her up after services, and nobody told him, you don't pull up to the Orthodox synagogue and pour a carriage on Yom Kippur. So that didn't go so awfully well. Um, but he understood what it meant to have a, a strong basis in his identity. And he understood that to be a great Jew and a great American, far from pulling in opposite directions, actually reinforced each other. And there's a reason that that statue of him dominates the high point on the campus. Because I cannot tell you how many times, you want to say that the student's corny alert here, but it's the only speed I got, friends. I can't tell you how many times I think to myself, what would Louis Brandeis say? What would he tell us about a particular question? Because it's easy to think of him as somebody who just sort of lived in the clouds. He did not live in the clouds. He was a hard-nosed lawyer, a successful one, hard-nosed corporate lawyer, who became also known as the people's lawyer, and he saw no conflict in those things. He was a gifted scholar who, just as a justice alone, would be known today. One of the few A-plus justices who was also an A-plus lawyer. See, Kathy tells me I can't use sports metaphors in the classroom, but that would take what I really mean, okay? This guy was a 400 hitter as a justice and a 400 hitter as a lawyer. And that's rare to have that combination. But also, he was somebody who understood what real moral courage meant. Here is somebody who in 1915 agreed to be the head of the American Zionist movement, and he had to know that that could jeopardize his career. He had to know that he was putting himself in harm's way, but he did it because he thought it was the right thing to do. And by the way, a year later, when he's nominated to the Supreme Court, Louis Brandeis, one of the greatest justices we ever had, had 30 plus votes against his confirmation. Shame on the United States Senate that they could have done that. And it had something to do with the moral courage that he had, but he did the right thing. Nobody remembers the name of those senators who voted no, but we all remember the name of Louis Brandeis. Which brings me back to Delhi, a program that is about ultimately nothing less than nothing less than the continuation of an American Jewish community with a deep spiritual center. You know, there are certain texts that are sort of too well known to us, and so we stop taking them seriously, sort of know them too well, if you know what I mean. Right? You know, our, our tradition teaches that to save one life is to save a world. But we all sort of know that one, and so it almost goes down too easily. We forget what it really means. Think about that. To save a life is to save a world. Most of us actually don't get to be in the business of saving lives if we're not physicians or happen to be in some very unusual circumstance. We'll make it through a life never having the privilege of saving a life. But to educate a life, to open a mind, that's a kind of saving a life. And to open a mind, and to save that life, and then to send that life out into the world, that changes the world. That's the privilege of teaching. Those of us who are privileged to be in this profession know that feeling of being able to participate in the education of a young person, a college-age student. But then there are levels and levels. To educate a student is to change the world. To educate a teacher is an even greater multiplier effect. Because what is that teacher going to go out and do? That teacher is going to go out and change more lives. 
It's the effect of the shamas lighting the eight candles on the last night, right? That one can give rise to all. And they all burn. All brighter because of the one. You know, the Prophet Chaim was asked, what can we learn from modern inventions in 20th century? And he said, we can learn from the telegraph that something that is said one place can have a major impact someplace else. And he said, we can learn two things from a locomotive. One is that you can be one second late and miss everything. And the other is that one who is on fire can pull many sleepers. Well, that's what it means to train a teacher. Right? One who is on fire can pull many sleepers. And as Joe says, it's not just training teachers, but teacher leaders. That's level upon level upon level in terms of the multiplier effect. That means that we have the privilege to be engaged in training people who will inspire people who themselves will teach generations. That's powerful teaching and powerful learning, right? That's what it means to be involved in something much bigger than ourselves. And if we can talk as arrogantly as we would about changing the world, I think that's what it would feel like involved on that level, that's what it means to save a life, and that's what it means to save the whole world. And I think the project that Dellett is engaged in is nothing smaller than that. Laura, I think that's what you saw. And we are here to honor you tonight, but I think you would be the first one to say that the Shamas needs the first candle to light. And Sharon, your leadership in this program has been exemplary. And what you have done together and with all of our colleagues, my colleagues at the university, is an extraordinary contribution to the American Jewish community and therefore to the world Jewish community. And it's just the beginning. 10 years seems like a long time for those of you who are here at the beginning. And yet 10 years means that there's still so much left that can be achieved. It is a very significant piece of what we are about here. And I tell you, as the eighth president of this university, that I have, we have enormous pride in what this program has already achieved. And look forward, with your help, with great anticipation, to all the worlds we can yet change together. Now, when I refer to Justice Brandeis and that statue at the top of the hill, Laura, we'll have you back here on campus anytime you want, and you can look at that statue as often as you like, but on the odd chance that you can't be here every day, we'd like to bring a little bit of Louis Brandeis to you. So it is my great, my great privilege on behalf of a grateful university and a grateful community to present, and I will read you the inscription, in gratitude for your vision and leadership as we celebrate Dellin's 10th anniversary, May 10, 2012, 18 ER, 5772. And we could add, as the, the sun sets and Lag Omer ends, the last part of our Lag Omer celebration, when it is appropriate to light bonfires, the fires you have lit are the most important fires of all. Thank you.